have the wrong. Hi, everybody, and thank you, and welcome to our live stream on Fusion 360 Electronics. Today, we got a few guests that are going to be joining us. And um, while we wait for the, the class to build, I noticed there's a lot of people going in. So thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure uh, having these series, the different series with you, talking with the pros. And today we have a really special session. So as we get set up and we're answering some questions for those that are still joining us, I would love to learn where are you from? Where are you located? Just to let you know, Jorge and myself, we're located in South Florida. Jorge specifically is a little closer to Miami than myself. I'm a little closer to Fort Lauderdale. So for our friends from different countries around the world, we'd love to, lo to learn where you're at. India, Singapore, Europe, let us know, Latin America. Let us know where you're located in the meantime. Yeah, the class is building up pretty good, Jorge. It's, uh, we're getting a nice, uh, nice buildup going on here. So a lot of people are getting notifications now of, of the live stream. So they're joining us as well. Hi, Adrian. Hey, Hans. Glad you made it. Glad that you're here. Okay, let's just give it one more minute and we'll go ahead and start the live stream. Okay, so, oh, wow, are you seeing that, Jorge? We have some friends from the Netherlands, from Sri Lanka. Oh, Hans from Germany, thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. I know that the time difference is, might be a bit of the inconvenience, so I don't have enough words to say thank you for joining us. That is awesome that you're here yeah. with us. Yeah, we have <laughs> Northern Israel also. It's pretty cool. <laughs> that is awesome. Italia. Hi, Ardian. Thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. That is awesome. All the way from, from Italy as well. Okay. So, yeah, we, get, we got a nice mix from around the world going on. So, okay. So, you know, today, as many of you know, oh, France is in the house. Okay. So, as you many of you know already, you know, Fusion 360 does offer some very strong electronic design capabilities. And we always are striving for finding uh, companies that have adopted our electronic solutions in Autodesk and have adopted it for the, for the creation of their own products. And today we're gonna be learning from a company called Particle. If your design requires any type of uh, Bluetooth solution or IoT solution, or I should say tracking solution, is it quite possible that IO, um, Particle is going to be one of the products that will you be taking into consideration. So let me do a brief introduction to the team that was with us today. As you know, my name is Ed Robledo here, South Florida, part of the Fusion Electronics team. And with us today, of course, Jorge Garcia. Many of you, uh, many of you may know him really well from our... Uh, from our forums, as well as some other uh, live streams that we've done, as well as he's contributed quite a bit of information when it comes to uh, videos on our Fusion 360 YouTube page. And with us today, our special guest is Mohit Boyt. Mohit is a senior hardware engineer from Particle who designed and built their flagship IoT product lineup, as well as Ethan Pierce, which is a solution architect at Particle working with global customers who are building and deploying enterprise IoT. But before we actually come have them talk, let's talk a little bit and give you an introduction about Fusion 360 and what is that we're solving. You know, <clears throat> during the design process of any project or product exists three key ingredients, collaboration, smart design capabilities, and being able to work in a unified platform that really streamlines the process to easily make changes and analysis. Can you imagine having only one single application that could do all of this and do it well? So based on this, let's talk a little bit about Fusion 360. Fusion 360 is a cloud-based product development platform that combines industrial design, mechanical engineering, machine tool programming, simulation, and electronics all into one software solution. 
Gone are the days of you having to do multiple applications for development of your next product. Learn one interface and use it with all your tools, a true unification. Now, we've, we've had a customer success story with live streams and they actually have adopted Fusion 360 and they actually gave us the following quote. Fusion 360 has allowed our mechanical engineers and electronic engineers to work in a collaborative way to fit everything into one small bottle. Okay. Now, let's review about our electronic editors. If you don't mind going to the next slide and go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, and press uh, one arrow once. Well, the electronic editor in Fusion 360 consists of multiple editors. First, we usually start with the schematic editor, which is gonna be the logical representation of your design, of your electronic design. This is where you're gonna be using symbols and accessing our libraries. Now, the beauty of Fusion 360 electronics is that it keeps true real-time annotation with the circuit board. And let's talk a little bit about the circuit board. Circuit board is where you're gonna actually be working with the true capabilities of the design in real, how should I say, in real size. This is where you're gonna be using the components, doing the routing, placement of the components, determining how many layers you're gonna, you're gonna actually be working with the manufacturing uh, capabilities, rules, that way you make sure that your circuit board that you're designing is actually meeting any manufacturing criteria. Now, as you know, when creating a circuit board, you need to have access to libraries. And even though we have thousands of libraries and we have many um, distributors as well as manufacturers adding to our repository of libraries, the part that you need just may not be there. Therefore, we've created a library editor, a very sophisticated library editor, a library editor that will allow you to create a component footprint as well as a 3D model all in the same step. Okay, it includes a package generator and which is IPC compliant. And we have some non IPC compliant components as well in which you could just type in the size of the component details and it will build a component for you. Now, why is Fusion 360, which is a mechanical drawing part of it, and it's the key point right now, is the 3D PCB editor. From the circuit board, you're able to generate your 3D PCB, but as many of you already know, you could capture enclosure geometry, complex um, uh, enclosure geometry, or draw a geometry in which you're gonna be using for your PCB outline and import it into your PCB and from there generate the 3D PCB. Now, the beauty of it is that we have 100% annotation between the PCB as well as the 3D PCB. We're going to call it 3D PCB as well. That way we make the, gener uh, make the difference between the 2D and the 3D as well. Assets are actually extruded. What it means is that uh, the traces, the vias, every aspect of the circuit board is actually extruded. This is no longer a canvas. And let's go to the next slide. Now, because of this, and being the center of electromechanical design capabilities, it's being the center of it, it always has the latest version. And because of this, we're able to do se with there several aspects of Fusion 360 in which we could take advantage of, and therefore we could do thermal analysis, we could do rendering, we could drive a CNC machine to get the board etched, as well as we're able to create manufacturing drawing and last but not least, which is maybe the most important part, is actually inserting that 3D PCB into your enclosure just to make sure that it actually fits. Now, based on all these capabilities that we have with Fusion 360, we're gonna go ahead and introduce a company called Particle in which had been taking advantage of this. So with us today is gonna to be Mohit and, um, and Ethan gonna be talking about their line of products and how they've taken advantage of it. So thank you all for attending. Have a great time. And I'll let you take over, Mohit. And thank you for being here, Ethan and Mohit. Appreciate it. Ed, thank you so much. Uh, you and Jorge have been such a great impact to the uh, the Eagle and now Eagle Autodesk um, community. And you've had a great impact on my career and, and uh, Mohit's career. So I'm really excited to, to be here to help people learn a little bit more about what we did with Fusion um, and help people learn how they can leverage Particle uh, for their IoT products. Um, you can hit next for me. So I wanted to give a little bit of background on Particle. We are an edge to cloud IoT platform. Well, what does that mean? 
we saw three layers of the uh, IoT stack problem. Um, the first being the edge uh, portion, which is the part that we're mostly going to talk about today, um, where Particle makes hardware modules that are pre-certified to work on cellular carriers, as well as having FCC certification. Those modules run our device OS, and you can write your own application firmware. We take care of the connectivity, so we have the partnerships with the uh, telcos to get you uh, connectivity over cellular and Wi-Fi. Um, and then all of that data rolls up into our IoT command center. Uh, the cool part about that is you can move that data that comes from the edge into your cloud application, or you're able to view it uh, in the particle console. Next for me. So uh, one of the things that we wanted to do is introduce an asset tracking product um, because it seemed to garner quite a lot of uh, popularity from our customers building products in the field. Um, and that tracking service is built on top of uh, those three core components I introduced in the last content. Um, and we'd like to introduce uh, these tracking services. There's three core components of the tracking service. One is the location service, which is essentially getting um, high accuracy GPS for devices that are deployed in the field, as well as getting things like alerts from uh, your connected asset in the field and being able to retrieve that, that information um, from the cloud. The next is actually being able to configure your fleet of assets through our configurator tool. So if you need to get uh, a more rapid reporting interval from your refrigerator truck in the field, you can do that just through a few clicks uh, in our console. And the last thing is, uh, all this is built on top of what we're calling the Tracker Edge firmware. Uh, the Tracker Edge firmware is a, a field ready uh, firmware that you can deploy on your uh, asset today. Um, and if you wanna add a little bit of configurability to measure temperature sensors or air quality sensors or CAN bus messages, that's something that you can do. Um, next for me. And all of that wraps into uh, what we call our asset tracking plus. So I know I mentioned uh, temperature and some things like air quality, uh, whereas most off the shelf asset trackers just give you location, Particle focuses on giving you the ability to uh, have this plus of I have a specific need. I need to be able to talk to my refrigerator truck or talk to my vehicle. Um, and I can do that with uh, the particle tracking services. Next slide for me. Uh, so really, why did, why did we build this product? Um, and how did, why, why is this valuable for, um, for, for customers like yourselves when you're, you're building an IoT product uh, to deploy in the field? Well, the first is really, a majority of our customer base was already doing some kind of asset tracking. Um, customers were deployed in industrial uh, industrial products or deployed in vehicles. They um, uh, were already were already trying to build something on top of Particle, um, and so we said uh, instead of spending all that time to build from scratch on the Particle platform or on your own, we wanted to provide an 80 to 90% completed solution. Um, the great thing about this is that it reduces uh, teams time to market. Um, and we've seen up to a year reduction of, of time to market by uh, enabling the particle platform and the, these, uh, these tracker modules. And the value that this really brings is you're able to build an asset tracking solution very quickly, deploy it in market and be able to operate that fleet uh, and collect that data and market very quickly. Uh, and through our tools and the particle platform, you're able to actually make tweaks very quickly uh, in order to accommodate your business model, which is super cool. Um, next slide for me so we can dive into the really fun stuff. So now I've kind of covered kind of particle layered on top of that tracking services, but here's kind of the, fo the, the coolest part about this is, um, is the hardware. And Mohit's gonna get in deeper in terms of how particles leverage the fusion ecosystem um, to build both the Tracker One and the Tracker SOM products. Uh, the Tracker One, oh, go back for me. Tracker One is a field ready, field serviceable, uh, or fully certified product that's ready for you to deploy today. 
Uh, and that product is built on top of the particle tracker SOM uh, that we've spent a lot of time uh, building in the, the Fusion ecosystem. And the coolest thing about both Tracker One and your own custom solution built on top of Tracker One is, next slide for me, you'll be able to see that content on a map. So if you design your, uh, your industrial controller or your, your new vehicle um, and you want to add asset tracking into it, you'll very quickly out of the box be able to get uh, real-time map data that you can see uh, in addition to any other messages that you need to get out of your asset, um, whether that's state of charge or temperature or speed, whatever that may be, you can, you can get it right out of the box on Particle. Um, next slide for me, and uh, Mohit is going to take it away, introducing how Particle has built uh, the Tracker SOM and Tracker One through the Fusion ecosystem. Thank you, Ethan, uh, and thank you, Ed, uh, for hosting us today. Uh, I'm Mohit. I have been uh, I have been with Particle for about uh, seven years now, a little over seven years, and I've been using Eagle uh, for a longer time period than that. So it's. Uh, an exciting moment for me to share um, with you how at Particle we design products using Eagle, you know, give you a quite a small glimpse into what goes around, what obstacles we uh, encounter and how we solve them. Uh, so today's main star attraction is going to be this tracker SOM that Ethan just introduced. Um, over the years, we have built connectivity modules based on Wi-Fi, Bluetooth and cellular. Uh, but we have seen um, people building asset tracking solutions around them. So instead of having folks build custom solutions over and over again, uh, we basically decided to make this song and uh, through our experience of learning our customer stories, we threw everything at it. Um, so this is a um, you know surface mountable uh, pick and place friendly, even though this is uh, pretty big, it's pick and place friendly module that you can go uh, to mass production with. The, the key components uh, of this module are the UBlox GNSS uh, receiver, uh, which can actually track four different constellations, you know, GPS, GLONASS, Baidu, and Galileo. Uh, the cellular connectivity is provided by a Quactel module. Uh, we have two variants. Uh, one is for North America, which is the LTE CAT M1, based on the BG96, and then one for um, Europe, which is based on LTE CAT1. All of these modules come with eSIM. Uh, if you wanted to interface an external SIM, that is also possible. Um, all of your application firmware and the particles uh, device OS uh, currently runs on the NRF5240 SOC, which is again, a feature packed uh, um, system that has a uh, ARM Cortex M4 microcontroller along with a BLE, Bluetooth, Zigbee and thread uh, supported radio. We also added a IMU on board. For example, if you are, you know, doing any um, vehicular tracking and you want to notice if the vehicle is, you know, moving and not moving, um, vibration analysis, uh, stuff like that. So pretty powerful. So in addition to that, we also have a Wi-Fi ESP32 Wi-Fi transceiver. Now this is not necessarily designed to give you connectivity, but allows you to uh, do Wi-Fi locate. So you know, in case we are an extremely urban environment inside an urban jungle where a GPS lock may not be possible, uh, you can rely on SSIDs um, around that location to give you a fairly accurate estimate as to where you could be. We also have a, a built-in CAN transceiver uh, that allows you to talk um, CAN bus uh, to you know, vehicle uh, or micromobility or other industrial applications that require CAN communication. Um, we also have a onboard RTC and a watchdog that allows you to really achieve low power states. Um, we have native support for a single cell LiPo battery um, that does uh, charging, power path management. We have a fuel gauge that can give you a fairly accurate estimate of the state of charge um, and an external memory um, for data logging or um, having custom applications on the SOM. So all in all, this SOM is uh, feature packed. The idea that one could design a product basically, you know, as they say, just add power is basically what you would need to build a tracking solution with this sum. And so I'm going to talk about what it takes um, to design a product around this sum. Um, currently, you can buy this sum from our web store uh, as a sum itself or on an evaluation board. The sum uh, evaluation board basically breaks down all the GPIOs. Uh, that way, you can 
you know, quickly mock up a design without actually designing a circuit board. Um, the files for all of these um, uh, hardware libraries, especially the SOM, is available from Fusion 360. If you haven't tried Fusion 360, um, it's pretty impressive. Uh, I've been using Eagle for a long time and recently made a switch to the Fusion 360 that allows you to go from you know, ECAD to MCAD in just like one software suite. That's pretty awesome. So you can uh, download these libraries through Eagle or Fusion by searching particle devices, or you can uh, download them as zipped files or step files uh, from our GitHub repository. Um, building a product around the sum, as I said, is pretty straightforward. All you need to do is throw in a few peripherals. Um, no external circuitry, you know, complicated circuitry required. Um, you just need power uh, in way of communicating with the device through USB. Uh, if you are debugging, then a uh, SWD or a JTAG connector, and buttons and LEDs. Um, so you can definitely design a product around this, but we also wanted to show uh, how this, you know, could you create a product um, uh, based on this sum. So we created a, a technology demonstrator, which also is a turnkey product called the Tracker One. The Tracker One is um, a, uh, a tracking device that allows you, you know, with the built-in battery, allows you to uh, connect sensors to it so that you can track more than just the location and comes with a, a pre-configured uh, firmware. So you don't even have to write any single uh, line of code. You can just go onto our web console and configure it based on how you would like to use this um, device. Uh, so let's see, how did we go around going from a virtual CAD model on the left to a you know the real uh, deal uh, in a span of a few months? Um, so this was also an exercise in dock putting our own product. Like what does it take to design a product around the tracker SOM and you know what are the uh, challenges we face or you could face and how we could improve that um, in the future process. So today I'll talk about schematic layout, um, PCB layout and mechanical integrations. And along the way, I'll just, you know, uh, talk about um, what we learned uh, through this process. And just so you know, all of these files, uh, including the libraries and the design files for the tracker SOM, not for the tracker SOM, the tracker one and the evaluation board are freely available. Um, from our GitHub repository. So you can just download and view the files uh, or modify the files if you may wish um, on your own. So let's dive into the actual Fusion uh, 360 environment. Um, I think I'm getting bored of the slides. Let's see if, what we can do and showcase through uh, the Fusion 360. Uh, so right off the bat, uh, when you open a Fusion 360, it allows you to create a project uh, over here, which is the uh, Tracker 1 project. Uh, that is a combination of a schematic capture, a PCB layout, and a an, uh, mechanical integration. When we started working on this project, um, this was designed in Eagle. Um, when Fusion 360 Electronics was um, released, we then later imported that into uh, the Fusion 360. So the mechanical integration may not be as tight as it would be if you were to design this uh, natively in Fusion 360. But regardless, Mo Mohi, uh, before you move forward on this, though, mm -hmm. uh, being able, um, so you know, this is a project that's been around for a long time, and and of course you've been uh, working with with Eagle with it. And when once you started bringing this information over to Fusion 360, could you tell us about it? How was the experience? Of it was it pretty straightforward? Did you have to do anything special? Oh, yeah, it was pretty straightforward. You just create a new design, and then instead of creating your own schematic in Fusion 360, you upload your existing Eagle file onto the Fusion 360 and reference that um, to it. And so it automatically pairs your schematic with the PCB. Um, pretty straightforward. All the libraries and uh, parts already exist through Eagle Managed Library, uh, through library.io. So you don't even have to import libraries or parts specifically. It's just uh, a, like a smooth transition into Fusion. Excellent, thank you, Mohit. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still getting used to the environment in terms of you know uh, where the buttons are located and whatnot, but it doesn't take take too long. Um, so uh, this schematic is divided into four sheets. Um, whenever possible, we you know try to work with sheets. If it's a simple schematic, we stick to one. In this case, uh, we did four. 
So even though I said designing around this tracker SOM is pretty straightforward, we did add some bells and whistles uh, to make this uh, tracker one uh, uh, useful to a broader audience. So you can see here, we have the main tracker SOM uh, with lots of GPIOs. It's a pretty big uh, SOM with lots of features. Um, over here, you have uh, three mode, uh, three buttons, mode, reset, and user button that allows you to put the device into different modes if you're experimenting or developing on it. We have an onboard thermistor. Um, this is actually very critical. Um, since the tracker one uses a lithium polymer battery, uh, as you may know, lithium polymers, uh, you know, have the tendency to uh, uh, break or catch fire or you know even worse. So in order to make sure that the device you know doesn't do that, we have to make sure that the lithium polymer battery is not charged or discharged below uh, freezing. And so we have to make sure that when the device is operating, uh, that it, the temperature threshold is within uh, the threshold that we determine. So if the threshold is crossed, we can turn the device off and put it in a safe mode. Um, we also have a backup battery for the GNSS receiver. So in case of you know a battery loss, uh, it can still retain the alumnac of the star constellations, or if there is a power boot, it will still retain that information. So your um, off to a locked state or GPS lock is quicker. Uh, we also have a dedicated regulator for the GNSS. Um, even though this GNSS is powered just by a lithium polymer battery, the power supply will be clean. So we don't want to introduce any switching noise. And so we are using a dedicated LDO just for the GNSS. Um, one of my favorite things on the Tracker 1 is this uh, a nice little DC DC regulator made by analog devices. Uh, it's a beast. Um, you know, it's an extremely wide input uh, DC DC regulator, uh, all the way from six volts to 100 volts. So you can throw almost any power source at it and it will be able to, you know, regulate uh, down to five volts cleanly. We added a bunch of um, uh, input protection, you know, reverse uh, polarity protection, um, some pie filters to, you know, help please the FCC uh, police. So, you know, the device passes certification. Um, and so, yeah, if you are considering, uh, you know, having a wide input uh, DC-DC power source, um, consider this, this is a pretty interesting um, regulator. It comes with a soft start as well. So this could be used in um, in, in in Europe as well, um, Mohit? Uh, no, th so this would be more so for DC supplies. And so okay, for example, you know, if you are you know, using a 24 volt power supply versus a battery pack of a e-scooter, which can go up to 86 volts. So you, 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 know, you can feed it a wide amount of voltages and it will still regulate nicely. Got it. Um, then the second uh, part is we are using uh, USB-C. So we're not, we don't have any power delivery built into this. And this is just to support the, you know, the newest connector system um, with you know, uh, ESD protections on all the ports. We have an optional um, memory, an FRAM footprint that we did not populate. And then uh, since the GNSS um, you know, just directly has its antenna feed uh, exposed, you can add a passive antenna or you can add an active antenna. Uh, we have an onboard uh, LNA and a soft filter. Since the Tracker 1 is a multi-radio system, you know, you have Wi-Fi antenna, Bluetooth antenna, NFC antenna, and the cellular antenna. So it's a lot of uh, radio noise. And so how do you make sure that your GPS signal stays clean? Um, so by co using a combination of a soft filter that only allows you to, uh, you know, only allows the GPS signal to pass through, or rather GNSS, and then amplifying it with a low noise amplifier, you can get a very clean um, GNSS signal despite of all the RF noise around it. If you don't want to have this circuit on your board, you can always use an external active antenna, which you know comes with an LME and a soft filter. But since we have an onboard GPS antenna, we had to use this to improve the performance. Um, we also have an onboard RTC battery that you know allows for timekeeping in. Uh, when there's a power loss, we have CANBUS. Um, so the CANBUS doesn't have ESD protection on the SOM. Depending on the environment you work are working in, uh, you may or may not want to add uh, TVS protection diodes. We also added a um, current limiter 
So for example, the canvas you know, operates at five volts and if you're applying, uh, supplying five volts to an external supply, uh, if that fails, you don't wanna you know, have a short circuit. So this little device will uh, protect against power current. We also have uh, a whole bunch of GPIOs ex ex uh, exposed through the M8 connector, which are also all ESD protected. There's an optional debug uh, channel which supports SWD. So if you wanted to you know, do active debugging, um, you can also do that on the device. And a simple RGB LED and a couple of LEDs that show the status of the uh, GPS lock and um, charge status. So that's all the schematic. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out, um, I don't know how many of you use uh, Eagle or uh, in particular, um, the idea of using assembly variants. Um, I actually just recently discovered this, you know, even though I've been using it for a while, that you can create assembly variants uh, in your schematic that allow you to use the same schematic, but then define which components are to be placed um, and which not. So I have two of these um, assembly variants here. For example, when you're prototyping, you wanna maybe place a whole bunch of components that you will not require during production. So you can create these two variants. Uh, and so when you switch in between the variants, for example, if this, this is the basic variant, if I go to production variant, uh, would it automatically you know, cross out all the um, components that are not going to be populated in addition to just you know the test points the test points would show up on your bill of materials but you don't want that you don't want that because that's not a real component that's just a copper pad um, or you know we were talking about not having to populate memory it will cross it out and so it crosses out in the schematic but at the same time in the pcb um, it will disable the paste layer so that way, when you're applying paste, you know, you're know you not just applying paste to the pads that will, won't be populated. So that's a nice little trick, allowing you to create variants and also create variants in your bill of materials. Um, all right, so now that's the schematic rundown. Let's see what the PCB looks like. Um, so I feel like the visual, the coloring um, of the Fusion 360 is a little bit modern, You know how the contrast plays out. Um, so I actually, I'm liking this over Eagle now. <laughs> um, so as far as when we decided, decided to design this PCB, we used a uh, enclosure made by Takachi. Uh, their enclosure that we used for Tracker 1 is IP67 rated. Uh, they offer you complete step files uh, if you sign an NDA. So all you have to do is then import the DXF of their internal space into Eagle and then uh, assign that as the board dimension. Uh, if you were doing it in Fusion 360, the process is even more easier because you can you know, just define the board shape and actively edit it whenever you want to. Um, so after this, uh, you know, applying the design constraints for uh, the board layout, I mean, the dimensions, we started laying it out. So this is a six layer board. The actual SOM sits on the bottom, while on the top we have, um, all the electronics. Um, one of the challenging aspects of this particular design was using a IP67 rated uh, USB-C connector. Um, I'll talk about that shortly, um, but if you're using, you know, working with IP67 and you're using a USB connector that requires a slot, be very, very careful. Um, we also uh, had to add a whole bunch of ground voids to make sure the antenna next to it um, you know, wasn't uh, affected by it. Um, and then, you know, even the mounting holes don't have uh, the copper pad around it, uh, while on the left they do because we have a whole bunch of antennas around here. Um, another cool thing that I like that has, you know, helped a lot is, you know, being able to assign, um, uh, you know, certain signals as differential pairs or giving net classes to assign rules. So, you know, if you're, you know, train, train, um, laying out a power trace, you can assign that it needs to be, you know, a minimum of, you know, say 20 mil or 25 mil width. We can route uh, multiple nets at a time. Uh, we can assign rules for differential pairs that allow you to, you know, quickly um, and easily route differential pairs. In this case, we are routing um, the USB uh, differential pair. So, now that we have seen the layout, again, uh, these files are 
available on our GitHub. So if you wanted to, you know, just open these up and study them, uh, you're free to do so. You know, and you know, maybe make your own. Who knows? Uh, once you're done doing the schematic and layout, the most powerful aspect I would say for Fusion 360 is you know a quick conversion to a, a 3D model. And now the 3D model is not, is not just an output, but it's an active element. Uh, I earlier said that this was exported from Eagle, and so the PCB traces for now show up as uh, a canvas, so you can't really edit the traces. Uh, but if I were to design this whole thing again in Fusion 360, we would be able to uh, do that. So uh, just the ability to view your schematic in three dimensions, seeing um, how you know the mechanical components will um, be laid out and how they interfere or not interfere with each other is extremely valuable. And so once you are done with this, you can you know, easily export that in, as a step file or other files and import that into your actual final assembly, uh, which then you know, actually uh, allows you to view how the PCB will sit inside your actual product. For example, if I were to take out the top cover here, you can see uh, schematic or the PCB fits uh, nicely into it. You know the holes are aligned, so you know, you know it will fit. Um, so, you know, as earlier I was saying that the IP67 rating um, was difficult to achieve in the first pass is, is because achieving a 67 rating on a circular hole is pretty straightforward. You add O-rings or you, you can easily seal holes. But when it comes to slots, um, it's not a, that easy, uh, especially with this USB-C uh, connector that resides on the PCB and it's pressed against the wall from inside, it's hard to guarantee a accurate and complete seal. Um, so we had to you know, uh, think about this problem uh, for a while, but the immediate solution was we added a bunch of epoxy glue around the connector to actually make it fully waterproof. We also added a foam pad uh, around this location so that would press the PCB uh, on this face uh, of the uh, enclosure and that way you you know have a, a good mating. The other thing you may have noticed that um, we also added a, a whole bunch of EMI shields. So if I were to, on the bottom of the actual SOM, you'll see um, these were also, you know, these can easily be mocked up in Fusion 360 and added to the design as a component. Um, these are basically, you know, 0.2 millimeter uh, laser cut uh, tin sheets. I also learned that it's pretty straightforward and easy for you to design and use EMI shields, like custom. All you have to do is, you know, create a 3D model with the dimensions and send it out to a shop. Um, we have an office in Shenzhen, so a shop in Shenzhen that basically laser cuts, bends, and delivers uh, these uh, shields within 48 hours, which is pretty powerful. So you can quickly iterate as to how you and what, would want. And what format did you give them the those those tin shields? Uh, I, I believe they step were- Step files or something like that? Step files, yes. Okay. Um, and they basically will convert it to DXF and you know, you know, know figure out which, how to cut it and where to bend it, <laughs> which is pretty impressive. That um, is pretty impressive. Very, very nice. Especially that you're able to model it directly on the, on the rendered uh, 3D PCB as well. Exactly, and we also added an optional uh, EMI shield, which you know you'll see it on the actual product. Um, so this is again, you know, to please the FCC police uh, to make sure we don't have any spurious emissions coming from this DC DC regulator, uh, which to begin with is clean, but you never know. And so having an optional, uh, you know, starter mask to solder in a EMI shield later in the day is extremely valuable. The one thing we did not do um, during the design is doing wiring wiring harnesses. I know from Ed and Autodesk, uh, they have said that you know in the future releases, uh, they might, or not might, but will make uh, uh, designing hardware harnesses or wiring harnesses much easier. So we can actually fully uh, visualize how the cables would be routed to the kind in addition to just seeing the placement. So I, I believe that's going to be a helpful addition. Um, we also designed a whole bunch of light pipes in the, on the top body that allow us to, you know, project the light coming in from the LEDs onto the holes. So, you know, making sure that um, the holes are aligned. 
helps. Uh, the buttons are not exposed. The buttons are only used uh, when you're developing or actively debugging the board. So you basically won't need a talk cover then. Um, so that's all I have in terms of um, how we went about designing the circuit board, how we used um, Fusion 360 to do the mechanical integration and you know some of the challenges uh, that we faced. If you have further questions related to the product, uh, we have our community forums um, at community.particle.io that you can log on to and ask questions. Um, you can email us at support at particle if you have further questions. Um, but remember, all these designs are open source, so you can you know just play around, look at them, modif modify them uh, as necessary. Excellent, thank you, Mohit. That's uh, very interesting and visually very appealing, to be honest with you. Um, and thanks for letting us know, especially what challenges you were running into when you're actually um, uh, trying to get this uh, product uh, done out there. So if you have, um, if you want to know more about it, please join um, the, the community which Particle offers, as well as you can always join and get more information and well as the electronic capabilities and its design workspace capabilities on our forums. So just look up Fusion 360 Electronics. I will go ahead and try to add that link to the um, uh, to the chat in case you would like to join our, our active discussion on Fusion 360 Electronics in which we're constantly getting more and more members to adopt Fusion 360. So, you know, uh, being able to build something like this and actually take a good look at it as it's real will actually reduce your, will, will allow you to virtually run into any challenges you're gonna run into in the design and what it's gonna look physically, therefore optimizing <clears throat> Uh, your time to go to market. So, uh, Mohit and Ethan, thank you so much for being here. It was, it's was it been a pleasure. And let me see. I don't see any questions here. So, you know, Mohit gave us a really nice breakdown. And the best part, Mohit, and I can't, I don't have enough words to express my appreciation, is the way you were able to break down that schematic part by part with exactly what they do. Based on that, a lot of us could learn quite a bit more about Electron itself and how we, we could apply it as well. Uh, by learning the taxonomy of what you've designed in the past from the board as well as the schematic portion of it. So it's been awesome. Everybody have a great day. Thank you for being here. And if you have questions, please join our Fusion 360 Electronics and we'll get you the answers. Jorge, thank you for everything as well. Ethan, Mohit, uh, greatly appreciated your participation. You guys have a great day. It's been a pleasure. Bye, everyone. Thank, thank you so much. Bye-bye.